You know, I shouldn't be preaching today. Lori should be up here today. She was on the schedule, but she said to me, are we talking about emotional unhealth? Because if we are, I think, he, I think you've more experience with that. <laughs> now, she, no, she didn't actually say that specifically. What she said to me was, hey, if you can preach next Sunday, I'm, like, I'm really tired from heart. But what she meant was, I knew what she meant. <laughs> and what we want to talk about is, how many of you know that what is said is not often what is heard? And in the midst of this, we don't hear what is, we hear as we are. And every single one of us had some commonalities that we want to lead into. And truthfully, Aiden just just led us beautifully to look at our perfect Heavenly Father. And so we're looking at meaningful relationships in this context that resilient disciples of Christ, they cultivate meaningful relationships with other followers of Jesus. They desire to be around and become like themselves. And a critical issue that we're addressing this month together is both in church leadership, but also in congregations, God is pruning his church. Because for too long, we have defined spiritual maturity by disconnecting it from emotional maturity or emotional health. In other words, it's how much I can preach, pray, and prophesy. That's how spiritual I am. Well, that's a part of your life. But if you can preach, pray, prophesy at a level 10, but you're an emotional infant at level one, this is going to be problematic. This is going to be an issue. And for far too long, we've divorced these things as separate, and they're not separate. They're interconnected and they matter. And so like an iceberg where you can see a little bit outside of the surface of the water, but there is much more underneath. We can see one another today, but there's much more underneath that we can't see that we all bring. We bring the parts that you can see, but there's tons under the surface that influence and form and shape and are really significant that that others cannot see, but are equally present. And so today we want to talk about some family matters. Here's what all of us have in common. No matter our relationship status, every single one of us have a family of origin. And none of us come from or create perfect families. They don't exist. Every single one of us come from a family, an imperfect family, imperfect in different ways, healthy or unhealthy in different ways, but equally. There's no such thing as a perfect family. Every single one of us come from imperfect ones. And I know I'm in tender areas today, so I'm going to be as tender as I can, but I'm not going to be intimidated to go here because this is where the Holy Spirit desires for us to go. You know, you and I follow Jesus. So there is a personal side to your relationship with Christ. But the moment you said yes to follow Jesus, you are also connected to a wider body called the family of God. So there's a personal part of what you do, but then there's an interconnected part in what we do together. And so how you and I let Jesus move or simultaneously don't let him move, it matters not only for you, it matters for every single one of us. If we as a church get healthier, you know what? We all get healthier. If we as a church do not, if we individually say no and then we together say no, it matters for our witness in regards to the city. So our perfect heavenly father, he forms us in family and then through difference. One difference is our interdependence, not our codependence, our interdependence. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 4 to 7, and then verse 16 says, now there are a variety of gifts, but it's the same spirit. There are a variety of service. There's a million different ways you can serve, but it's the same Lord. There are a variety of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them in everyone. To each, everyone say to each. So there's an individual part, to each is given a manifestation of the spirit. To each is given a spiritual gift. Why? For the body, for the common good. It gives your life purpose, but it's not all about you. You are given something to serve the body. And so if you're not serving the body in any way, then you are being disobedient and stewarding what God has given you as a gift to make a Jesus-sized difference in other people's lives. And so this is what the scripture says. So there's an interdependence. Because I am not an I, or sorry, And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body, that would not make it any less 
part of the body. So the ear doesn't need the eye to hear. It needs the eye to see. Interdependence. The ear can't do everything. It can only do what it was designed to do. And you and I can't do everything. We can only do what we're designed to do. But when we all do what we're designed to do, the body is the best reflection of everything that Jesus said and did. Yet when you and I are dismissive or ignorant or bury that, that has a significant effect and issue. Sharon Hood Miller says this, that Paul's vision of the church as a body or a family is a great metric for discerning when a member is being divisive. If an arm complains it is in pain, it is not dividing the body. But if an arm accuses a foot of not being a part of the body because it isn't an arm, that is divisive. Another way that we are woven together in difference is positionally. The moment you gave your life to Christ, again, we are now a part of God's family. And Paul says in Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, this has many layers. I'm just going to touch one. He says, there's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There is no male. There is no female. For you are all one. Everyone say one. one. We are all one. In Christ Jesus. Now, here's what Paul wasn't saying, and then let's dive into what he did say. Paul isn't saying that difference is gone. He's not a simpleton. It's not like he looks out at the world and goes, I don't see men, I don't see women, I don't see Jews, I don't see Greeks, I don't see those who are in slavery and those who are free. He's not saying all of this went away. What he's recognizing is that each and every one of us go through the same life, but we go through it differently. What he's highlighting is this. Sometimes the way in which you and I go through life will qualify or disqualify us. We will see ourselves as disqualified from some of the very things that we have access to in Christ. It's powerful and it's significant. Paul is saying in Christ, we're one. What I have access to, you have access to. Matthew chapter 16, Jesus said, behold, I give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Now, oftentimes, what is the key good for? The key is actually to be put into a door and to have access to somewhere that if you didn't have that key, you had no access to that door. Thus, what's in the house. Make sense? Not rocket science. Too many followers of Jesus, when we hear about the keys of the kingdom of heaven, we preoccupy ourselves. Oh, Jesus has given us keys. Then we get to determine who gets in the house or not. That's not our job. That's God's job. But some of us go through life, and here's what he is saying. Some of us go through life, and not all of us go through life equally or evenly. And because of how we go through life, there are some of you today, right now, that have keys in your hand that you have never put into the lock to access what you have available in Christ because you don't believe you're qualified. You have disqualified yourself from access to something that Christ has provided for you and then you are living defined and confined by somebody else's opinion of you rather than who your father sees you as. Your perfect heavenly father. This is what Paul is saying. You know, personally speaking, each of my children are becoming, they're, they're teenagers, but also now becoming young adults. Do you know what that means? It means Lori and I are parents, but we are also brothers and sisters in Christ with them. And so sometimes we got to figure out when to be parents. And sometimes we got to figure out when are we equal brothers and sisters in Christ following the Lord together. As Jason said when he was hosting a few moments ago, because there is no junior Holy Spirit whatsoever, as teenagers are growing and becoming young adults, we have to honor. honor. Biblical honor flows two ways, not one way. It flows both ways. And so we need to learn how to honor them, not just, oh, as kids or young adults. We need to honor them as co-equal brothers and sisters in Christ. And that's awkward, but it's a healthy tension. Two stories we want to talk about today, and they're family stories. And speaking of families, I want to congratulate Taylor and Amber, who are getting married this afternoon. They're usually sitting just over here, but I want to congratulate them. It's going to be amazing. But we want to look at the family stories of Joseph this week and David next week. And I want to talk just for a few moments about your family of origin and the journey that each of us has together. 
Together we're gonna, or today we're gonna traverse 17 challenging years. We're gonna do it quickly. Today's family is often described as two to four generations who move through life together, sometimes in different home and geographical places, but you're doing it together at the same time. And so there's an interconnectedness between you and your family's story. And the same is true with Joseph. And if you look at the life of Joseph, while there is much that we can teach through, we taught through it last year, his story, while there's much that we can look at the life of Jesus, or Joseph excuse me, and teach through, there's one thread that pulls all the way through, and it is perception. Joseph's life is a study in perception. How others see him or don't see him affects him. How others see you or don't see you affects you. How others validate or invalidate affects you. How others elevate or put you down, it affects you. And Joseph's of his story of different people seeing different things or not seeing things in his life. It's just a thread that goes through it. Joseph's father is a gentleman. He's a patriarch named Jacob. And Jacob is an incredible man of faith in the Bible but he also has a profound flaw that he's a deceiver. He uses deception. Deception is woven into his family's story. And so Joseph is a favored son of his parents. And as a result of his parents' favor, his brothers are intensely jealous of him. So much so that they sell him into slavery. And the moment they sell him into slavery, they do what you do in Jacob's family. You lie about it. There are things in our family of origin that are sinful and broken that power passed down. And you see this in Joseph's story. Joseph's brothers, they tell Jacob that he has been killed when it is not true. They are deceptive. Joseph is also falsely accused of a sexual crime. He's forgotten in prison. But due to God's providence and Joseph's faithfulness to let God work in him, he becomes the second most powerful person in Egypt. All that happens over 17 painful years that I said in four minutes. (laughs) Here's what we can clearly see looking through the life of Joseph. We can clearly see what he goes through, but what we cannot see until the end is how he he allows God to work in him under the surface of his life. So I can see whether you're here or you're at home. We can see who's connected right now, who is here right now. What we cannot see is the under part of your life where God is at work. We see the fruit of it or we see the fruit of it that could be, but we can't see oftentimes the outworking of what is. This is what is critical for each of us to embrace. And I say this and I pray pray you hear it with both ears and the wholeness of your heart. Whatever your family of origin wasn't or isn't, God is perfectly for you. Whatever your family of origin is or isn't, God is perfectly for you. He is your perfect heavenly father. And so let's pick up the story right towards the end. Joseph is now the second in command of all of Egypt which means in his hand, he has the power for revenge or he has the power for reconciliation. Not just over his brothers, but all who have wrought injustice towards his life. And here's what it says in Genesis 50, verses 15 to 12, 21. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, it may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you. If I just pause here for a moment, sin simply means we fall short. Whether you had a parent, you are a parent, or you're in a relationship with anyone, Anybody here have any perfect relationships? No, we all fall short. That the Bible calls sin. The next thing is iniquity. When we fall short, we have behavior that's crooked. 
We all wish to self-justify and explain ourselves sometimes rather than being honest. Hey, I said that because you said this to me. I only did that because you did this to me. It's the fruit oftentimes of iniquity, which is just behavior that should be straightforward. It becomes crooked. How many of you ever gone to someone's house? Can I see your hands, please? That's not a trick question. It's not like... Anybody walk into someone's house? Anybody walk into someone's house and nothing is said, but you can feel a tension in the air? You just walk in and nothing has to be said, and you're like, yeah, when can I go home? <laughs> hey, do you want dessert? No, thanks. No, thanks. I can't do sugar, gluten. Oh, it's all gluten free. Oh, what is in there? What's in it? I, I can't eat that either. I gotta go. I gotta go. I gotta go. <laughs> you can feel it. Nothing has to be said. You can feel it. Iniquity. Things that should be straightforward get really, really complicated. Like I've been in family dynamics. I've had the pressure and the privilege of being around families and crises. And it's wild because if you're not a part of a family, you don't pick up on the dynamics. But then later well, people will be like, yeah, you, you know when my aunt looked like this, it meant this, 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 this. <laughs> I just thought your aunt was looking over here. And oh, she wasn't looking, she was saying never would know. Things that should be straightforward become very complicated. That's, it. That's iniquity. And the last is trespassing. So trespassing is also a way that we can sin against one another, which simply means we can trespass by, rather than building someone up, we can say something that tears them down. It violates who God has created them to be. And that can escalate to incredibly unhealthy things and also criminal things that we do to one another. It's all the fruit of sin. And so this is being recognized here in the story. Say to Joseph, please forgive the transgression of your brothers and the sin because they did evil to you. And now please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Joseph's brothers also came and fell down before him. So Joseph's dream actually comes to pass. But preceding his dream is a broken Joseph, not a celebrated one. Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, do not fear, for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear. I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them, and Joseph spoke kindly to them. Others, even those you love and whom love you, might not always accurately recognize where God is at work in your life. When their father dies, when Jacob dies, Joseph's brothers mistakenly believe that he is only treating them well because their father's around. Anybody here ever have a sibling? Yeah. And you couldn't wait till your parents leave so you could treat your sibling the way you really wanted to? <laughs> this is what's happening in the story. This is what's happening. When even imperfect authority is removed, I'm going to say it again. When even imperfect authority is removed, it is an opportunity for God to take greater root or for a stronghold to take greater root. And this is what is occurring in the story. At Joseph's story's beginning, his brothers envy him and their envy makes their vision of who Joseph is really blurry. Now at this defining moment, his brothers... They don't envy him, they fear him. And it is their fear of Joseph which equally makes their vision of who he is blurry. Why do I say that? Because how they see him is significant. But the same Joseph in the beginning of the story, before he is sold into slavery, is not the same Joseph that is standing in front of them today. Yes, he is still their brother. Physically, he's all the same. He's Joseph. But how God has worked in him is completely different. 
how his brothers see him, listen, how his brothers see Joseph no longer defines who Joseph is or how Joseph is going to respond. Loved ones, you do not need somebody else to change for you to be everything that God has called you to be in Christ. Stop waiting for them to change and let God change in you what he needs to change. Say to Joseph, please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you. I just read it. I'm reading it again. And now please forgive the transgression of the servants of your God, the God of your father. And so Joseph wept when they spoke to him. And sin and brokenness of our families of origin, they can do one of two things. They can define us or they can refine us. And we get to choose which. Truthfully, they first do both. They define us and then they begin to form us and shape us. But into whose image they form and shape us is critical. I've grown up like you, and and this wasn't a mantra in my home, but growing up, I've heard this often, that family is? Family's first. Family is? Family is everything. No, God is everything. Family is a gift. It's a gift. If family is everything, it's an idol. And every idol, even the good ones, form us into their image. And I'm not saying your parents were imperfect or like terrible people. I'm just simply saying Your life will not fulfill its destiny if you are formed into the image of your parents, but they will be formed if you're formed into the image of God. And that's not dishonoring parenting. It is putting in its right priority. Look at how many times Jesus said, people came in and said, hey, your mother's outside. And he'd be like, who's my mother? He wasn't being dishonoring. What he was saying is, Yeah, that is my mother, but she is also, too, a follower learning of me. And then on the cross, he says, John, take care of my mom. That is a son brokenhearted for his mom. He knew differentiation. In Genesis chapter 15, verse 50, verse 18, as we just read, Joseph's original dream comes to pass, but Joseph is no longer the same. And I want to reread verses 19 to 21, and I want you to notice three powerful transformations that have taken place in Joseph. But Joseph says to him, to his brothers, do not fear, for am I in the place of God? What does Joseph say here? Essentially, do, do, do not fear, I am not God. Some of you, if you have put your family of origin in the place of deity, that needs to be dethroned. Not dishonored, dethroned. Do not fear, I am not God. And then he said this, You meant it for evil, but God, everyone say, but God, but God God turned it for good. That is redemption. Please hear me again with the same ears and the same full heart. God never condones the harmful things which wound us in our families. I'm going to say it again. Joseph is not saying Hey, brothers, everything that you did to me is all good. The Bible is actually pretty clear. It's evil what you did to me. And it is not spiritual to call evil good. That is deception. That is sometimes the language of abuse. To call that which is evil good. God never calls evil good. Ever. He calls evil, evil every single time. It should not have happened. It need not have happened. It was wrong every time. It was evil. It wasn't just a little bad. It was evil. It was sin, transgression. 
and iniquity, and it was not your fault. God never condones the harmful things which wound us in families. God never condones sin, ever. Listen, he doesn't condone it. He atones for it. He never ignores it. He never excuses it. He never diminishes it. If you ever want to know, if you ever wish to know two things simultaneously, the love that God has for humanity, and secondly, the pain that sin causes, look to the cross at the length of which his love would go and the brutality of which it cost him to pay the price. God never diminishes sin. He atones for it so we can be free from it. So God never condones the harmful things which wound us in families. But I also want to say he is also never confined by those things either. When it comes to our lives, our family of origin matters. But the moment you gave your life to Jesus, you were a part of another family, the family of God who has a perfect heavenly father. And whatever your family of origin is that reflected God, I honor it and I glorify it. And whatever your family of origin is or was that did not honor and reflect God, it is not who your heavenly father is. Joseph knew what it was to be loved and favored. He also experienced what it was to be broken, forgotten, and then redeemed by God. And like Joseph, to become emotionally healthy, we too must have the courage to honestly face the truth of how our imperfect family of origins form us while we learn to trust God, our perfectly heavenly Father. And I will say to you that in meaningful relationships, I have had wonderful assistance by the body of Christ. I have had wonderful friends in the body of Christ who have helped me see Jesus more clearly. You know what else I've had? I've had wonderful pastors in the body of Christ who've helped me see Jesus more clearly. I've had mentors in the body of Christ who have helped me see Jesus more clearly. And yes, I'm a man and I'm unafraid, I'm, not, I'm a, unashamed to say it, I've also had wonderful psychologists in my life, counselors who have helped me see Jesus and be more like Jesus. I've had wonderful coaches, spiritual directors. In other words, if God's put it in the body and it's to help me be more like Jesus, I'm not gonna let my pride hold me back from getting more and more healthy in every area of my life, including the emotional parts of my life. And nor should you. My life is not your life, but it's equal letting God go there. For 17 years, God is at work in the heart and life of Joseph. God works in his life and still today through people, events, and circumstances. And everyone said, amen. amen. Here's the challenge. So does your spiritual enemy. He works through people, events, and circumstances to form and shape your life. Joseph's story is a story, and this may be revelation for some of you. There are some of you today, whether you're here or you're at home, you often say, God, why me? And I hope I was really clear earlier that God never condones what you're asking him why me about. But some of us have a mistaken belief that God can only use the positive things in our lives. No, God can use all things in our lives. Some of us go through actual negative preparation in order for God to increase our capacity to steward what is coming down the road that we cannot see. Joseph was entrusted to steward a nation. And so God formed him in favor and God formed him in forgottenness. God is the God over all of it. He did not cause it, but he used all of it in Joseph's life. God is not confined to using only the good things. Whatever we bring to God, even broken things, he can use because God alone can transform what the enemy meant for evil. God turned it and made it for good. 
Three voice differential moments and we close. I want to just remind some of you. Some of you grew up in families where the dominant voice was be perfect, be perfect, be perfect, be perfect, be perfect. And I want to remind you that be, for, be perfect is not the voice of your heavenly father. That doesn't give you an excuse to sin. It is the perfection of what Jesus accomplished on the cross for us that gives us access to the Father, not the perfection of how you do life that gets you favor with God. Be perfect is not the voice of your heavenly Father. Some of you grew up and your dominant message was you're never enough. Never enough is not ever the language of the Holy Spirit. Hey, God knows all things. He knows we'll never be enough. If you and I could be enough, then Jesus didn't need to come. If we could be perfect through the law, then we could have just worked it out ourselves. We can't. All the law does is show us what we can't keep, not what we can. And lastly, in a world that is quite confused, freedom without boundaries is not freedom. It is slavery. Don't fall into the lie that freedom looks like removing every part of authority in my life and doing what I want to do. Again, that is not the language of humbly following Jesus. That is the language of a soul that is bound by a stronghold. So in Christ, we're one. And here's why it matters. Because we're different. Because we're real different. Here's why it matters. None of you are the hero of the story, nor am I. But there are some people who will hear the gospel from me, but because we're so different, there are some people who will not hear the gospel from me because they'll look at my life and they will say, you don't understand what it is that I've walked through. But then maybe you come along and you've walked something similar and maybe just maybe they can hear the gospel through you in a way that they will never hear it from me. We are one in Christ and we are the family. We are the body of Christ together. And so while you're not the hero of this story, your life and your emotional health, you becoming more like Jesus, using your spiritual gift to serve for the common good, it is so significant. And that is why your spiritual enemy consistently works to disqualify you from doing anything because he knows if you will even take your heart of disqualification, God, I feel this every single day and offer it up. God will heal it. He'll heal it. He'll heal it layer by layer, layer by layer. And he knows the danger you are to his kingdom, to the kingdom of darkness. If you can get healed and get set free, watch out how God can use your life and let hell quake when Jesus sets you free. Heavenly Father, each and every one of us are broken vessels, but it is your brokenness. It's our brokenness through which your light shines out to a lost and broken world. Father, I know we're on real tender ground today. Brings up a lot of stuff. And Father, what it brings up, Holy Spirit, only you want to heal. And so now, Father, in just this beautiful way that you can lead us, Father, just continue to love and lead our every step. Help us to be inspired by Joseph, but to become more like Jesus. Amen.